So hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for your um, patience there while we got everything set up. Um, this is Homebrew 68K retro computing using low cost FPGA boards. Um, if you're not here for that talk, you're in the wrong place. Or are you? Yeah, I guess, I guess you'll be the determiner of that, right? Um, so who am I? So my name is Keith Monahan. Um, my background is in uh, computer science. Um, I manage software teams doing software quality assurance, right? And so I test to make sure that everything works the way it should. Um, so I'm a hobbyist like many of you. Um, I've been coming to these hopes since uh, 1994. A long time since the first one, right? Um, and even have the pale blue ugly t-shirt to prove it. Um, so I like solving hard problems. I like challenges, right? And so a lot of what you're going to see here today, right, is um, a bit like reinventing the wheel in some cases, but it comes from my desire to sort of understand um, how computing works uh, fundamentally, right? A lot of us take uh, for granted when you push the power button what actually happens, you know? Um, from the time the, the hard drive or the SSD, right, uh, comes on for the first time, well, you know, what happens? What does the processor do? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens. And so uh, I want to sort of deconstruct that a little bit. And going simpler, going to these 68K machines when, you know, it's just like working on cars, right, and like some of our parents worked on cars back in the day, right, when you could get under the hood and actually play around with the cars. This is sort of uh, not unlike that. And so I, I said what I am, you know, what am I not? So I'm not an EE, like not even a minor, right? Little professional experience in electronics. Um, so you'll see flaws today. You'll see flaws in the hardware, flaws in the software, and yes, even flaws with me in the presentation, right? Okay, cue audible gas, that's your turn, right? Oh, there we go, thank you very much, right? But that's okay, we're all human, so, um, you know, this presentation is uh, as much about sort of the struggles and the story about um, how I've been working through trying to get this um, sort of um, Frankenstein built and operating and running. So I'm building a computer. And so a lot of people say, oh, build computers. I build computers. I go to PC Part Picker. I go to Newegg. I go to Tom's Hardware, right? And I plug all these things together, right? And then when, when that doesn't work, what do you do? You swap out the video card. You swap out the motherboard. You try some other memory, right? Um, but that's really not what this talk's about, right? We're talking about retro computing, and we're talking about building something from scratch, now, that's not building the processor itself, right? Um, but collecting a bunch of different pieces together in order to make it work. And, and I'll talk more about that. So uh, I'm building a computer. So what I'm not doing is stacking a whole bunch of Arduino shields together, like you see in this picture. Um, not about Raspberry Pi. And by all means, like I have a ton of respect for what's been done in terms of lowering the cost of entry of computers, lowering um, that sort of barrier to entry. You know, these, you know, what's the Raspberry Pi Zero cost? Five dollars, right? And so um, I think that's great. But that's also not what I'm doing here, right? And so, uh, yeah, a lot of projects are assembly projects. So what do you do? You say, I want to build a... Raspberry Pi system. So what do I do? I go to this site and I buy this piece and I buy that piece and I buy uh, something else and I plug them together. And there's already an ecosystem that exists, right? These guys that make the boards are trying to sell their boards. And so they provide good support. You've got the YouTube videos, you've got the forum, you've got the software tool chain, right? You know, um, and so there are um, some folks that are doing the heavy lifting in terms of like, uh, for instance, getting cross-compilation working um, for the ARM processor. 
um, you know, on, on Intel and vice, and vice versa. So um, there's no doubt that there's some heavy lifting that's being done, but for the overall general consumer, it's already been done, right? There's instructions. We go to some site, right? There's some manual. And so there's, yeah, lots of help because it's a well-traveled path. Um, this is um, because there's so many of these resources available out there. Um, it really makes it a little bit easier, right? And so, uh, you know, one of the things I like to do is uh, eat whenever I'm in New York City. And um, coming to Hope over these last, I don't know how many years this is, I'm bad at math, but uh, last 20 years or something like this, uh, one thing I like to do is eat. I like to go, you know, just ate at a big uh, bagel place uh, earlier where they got these monster-sized, you know, football-sized uh, bagels. Delicious. Um, but this is, you know, when you look at these assembly pr projects, a lot of these are like eating at a Times Square restaurant. You go there because it's easy, you're hungry, and you want to be sort of force-fed. And so I... I like to, to, uh, to, to branch out a little bit and take that less traveled path. Now, for what it's worth, like, it's not for everybody. And um, there's a lot of struggles, and um, there are a lot of things that we take for granted, and as a result, uh, makes it harder. And so, um, you know, I talk about homebrew, right? Homebrew 68K. What does that mean? So there was a time, and, and I was probably knee-high to a grasshopper at the time, right? But there was a time whenever homebrew computer culture was sort of normal, right? We bought kits. You know, I think that one of the big things for the Motorola, some of the earlier processors, one of the selling campaigns was, hey, buy the CPU for only $25, and you can build your own computer, right? And so, you know, as a result of these cheap available microprocessors, now you can own a computer in your own home, right? You can, you can do computing at home. And so, um, and so, you know, you've got the kits out there, the peripheral chips, and I mentioned RAM. Like, RAM was really expensive, right? RAM was going to cost more than the, than the CPU itself. Or you could buy a kit, you know, and there's a lot of action lately, it seems, uh, just, just over the last day since I've been here, talking about the, um, the Altair uh, 8800 and all of these similar machines, right? And so, um, yeah. And so you've got ties um, to the, to the homebrew uh, culture uh, with Stanford and Silicon Valley and so forth. And, um, you know, with being as many uh, Apple fans as there are, there seems to be in the world, everyone sort of like read the stories, right, and have seen the pictures. And, yeah, this was, was built in a garage and that type of thing. And if you take a look at this um, computer that I've built today, you know, it looks like it was built in a garage, right? Um, there's painter's tape holding down the LCD, there's, um, at one point, I sort of upgraded to, um, to Gorilla Tape, right? Because I needed something to hold it down to the plywood base, right? And so the, the funny thing is, is that it started out as sort of a, a practical approach to how to mount this stuff. But then I sort of liked the vibe a little bit. Like, the duct tape doesn't bother me. Like, I actually am glad I'm using duct tape, right? And so this DIY computing thing is, um, is what we're talking about today. Same, same concepts. So my project is, is different, um, like I've said. This, so this is a creation project. There's really no manuals. Now, um, there's data sheets, right? So I buy an FPGA, and of course there's a data sheet. And of course there's manuals that talk about you know, um, how to interface with this particular controller or how to do this particular function in there. And so that's not to say that there isn't, um, you know, support documentation, there is. But the problem is, is that what I'm trying to accomplish, there's no A to Z manual, right? And so this makes it tough. There is no YouTube help. Um, I can't join an IRC channel and say, hey, I'm trying to do this, but it doesn't work. And a, a lot of what I'm doing um, as a result of being unique, 
makes it really hard for me to actually get, um, to get help, right? So very specific things if I have a very specific question. But what happens um, when I power it up? And, you know, hardware is really tricky because, you know, when software fails, and I know pl uh, about plenty of the bugs and plenty, pl plenty, ugh, sorry, plenty of the problems that I see in normal day-to-day, -day, in my normal day job, I see, see bugs, I see errors, and usually there's some symptom, right? What's the symptom? You know, it says, you know, um, you know, some library can't be found. There's some error that's displayed on the Chrome console, right? And so you have sort of these symptoms that allow you to, to say, well, I did this, this error created, and what do we all do? Like, what's the normal path for solving a problem? And yeah, Google, right? Uh, Stack Overflow, I heard, I think, right? Um, and so we cut and paste that error code, and we see, hey, has other people had this? Uh, the same problem, and that really is, um, is tough. It's sort of slow going. So, um, yeah, no guarantees of success or making wise design decisions. And so what happens, right, is um, I look to the earlier 68,000 computers for guidance in terms of like the Commodore Amiga, um, even like the Sega Genesis. I've got a few, uh, you know, Sega Master System as it was known, I think, in Europe. Um, and I've got a couple of these disassembled, right? And so I can see, um, you know, well, how did they do things? And so I can guide some of my design for this computer uh, based on those, um, based on those other examples. But the problem is, is that invariably they use some custom ASIC, right? They use some custom chip that was specific to that particular application. And even though like um, re-implementations of that stuff is available, um, that's not what I want to do. And so a lot of times all of that glue logic, all of those extraneous functions that really make the system possible um, have to be created by me. And the problem is, is that there's really like sort of no guarantee of success so that it, if I make a mistake now, because for instance, let's say I'm interleaving the uh, CPU rights to the frame buffer and um, with the video driver that also has to access that same buffer, what does that do to performance, right? And so some of those things are not immediately obvious, right? Because half the time, I'm just happy when this stuff works at all, right? <laughs> and so it's slow going. Yeah, the modern computing world takes too much for granted, and that's definitely sort of a theme of the talk here. Um, going back to my restaurant reference, right? Instead of going to the Times Square restaurant, it's like finding a hole in the wall in, in Flatbush. Uh, do we have any native New Yorkers here? Okay, yeah, fantastic. And then, how do we switch over to it? Is this switch to this on the screen? Yeah. I know how to do it right now. Okay, but not right now, but maybe I'll give you the high side. Yeah, you know, maybe let them know how to do it. Yeah, fantastic. I'm sorry about that. Actually, I think we can just check one more time. Thank you for your help. Okay, and so um, native New Yorkers, did I see any hands out there? It's hard to see with these lights. Okay, so Flatbush, right? Is going to a restaurant in Flatbush, is it? It could be awesome, but it could be disastrous, right? Uh, I came to New York on work a couple years ago, and my friend took me into Harlem to this barbecue place, and I was le we were legitimately the only two white people there. And the, the guy that was uh, serving food was said, well, what do, you, what do you want? What are you doing here? And I was like, well, wait, do you know me? <laughs> you know? And uh, he says, well, okay, I'll serve you anyways, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. And he really meant no disrespect. He really meant no harm, just in, in that um, must have been a surprise. Uh, for for what, it, what it's worth, is really uh, delicious, good food. So, um, you know, so yeah, it could be awesome, but could be disastrous. And that, that helps uh, <laughs> explain this. So let's not kid anybody, right? So I've talked a lot about like, well, yeah, I've had to do this and I've had to do that, but we all stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Um, there's there's uh, plenty of work that's been done. Um, I've had plenty of help from a variety of different sources and some of this um, uh, friends, uh, friends of friends. Um, I've got a, a friend in Canada that's helped me with the PCB layout using KiCad. Um, 
And, uh, and so I've had plenty of help too. Um, uh, Frederick Requin as the creator of the J68 core, which is a soft core processor that, uh, that, that's, that I use here. Without that J68, right? And, and just so you, you fully understand this uh, sort of concept of soft core, um, you, you may be used to some different concepts of soft core, uh, if you watched the previous presentation especially, right? Um, but essentially, instead of having a physical processor chip, you have logic that sits inside an FPGA, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but it sits inside an FPGA that performs the same function. So you get the same function, but you don't have the necessary chip. The nice thing about FPGAs is, is that if you have one that has a reasonable size, you can fit a whole bunch of logic inside there, including uh, CPUs, even multiple CPUs, right? And so if you want sort of a multiple core, uh, computer, you certainly can do that if you want to, with the idea that you've got to find some way to connect and make them work. So without that core, I'm sort of dead in the water. Um, authors of 68K books, and I have some resources um, at the end of the presentation that sort of talks about um, which, which books and so forth. Um, generally speaking, uh, Alan uh, Clements and Alan Wilcox um, were two authors that produced a series of 68,000 books that I highly recommend. The best part about this is that I go to Amazon and I find these books for like $1.88. And like, these are the Bibles. Like, I'm referring to this stuff daily. And I'm like, this is fantastic for two bucks. You know, I've got a guide to these old processors, right? Um, and so Pong P. Chu, right, author of this FPGA prototyping by example. There's one, there's a VHD uh, L version of the book and a Verilog version. And those are two languages that we use to describe hardware within FPGAs. Um, and uh, those, that book's pretty nice. Okay, so here we have is the creation, right? This is the Frankenstein. And, um, and I'll briefly walk you through the different sections of this. Um, in the top right-hand corner, you have a, a seven-inch uh, LCD. It's a touchscreen. Got it from Adafruit for like $47, right? Pretty cheap. Um, I have that attached. If you follow that brown cable down, um, and then the yellow, uh, or I'm sorry, the white cable that leads down towards the bottom black um, PCB, which I don't know if, well, does this work? Oh, you guys see that? And so you see this white cable. Now, hold on. Okay, now here we go. Uh, you, can you tell I don't do public speaking for a living? <laughs> uh, does my mouse? That's a good, good question. No, it does. Oh, oh, look at that. Look at I'm learning all kind of things today. See, I, I, I told you I was, I was definitely not an expert. I was not joking. And so you see right here, right, so this comes down into a video driver board. And that video driver board, what you can't see underneath here is I used to have a solderless uh, breadboard with a ton of wires. And the problem with doing this is that um, there's a good chance for a mistake. There's a good chance for it not working properly. There's a good chance for too much stray capacitance as a result of the board. Um, if you go over to the left-hand side, sort of one of the smaller parts um, right here is the FPGA uh, board itself. Now, this is an eval board, $30. Um, I got it from Arrow. Does anybody know Arrow.com? Um, and so um, for $30, this board um, has been plenty powerful enough to work, right? And so it's able to run my 68,000 at 66 megahertz, which is pretty fast, right? Yeah, remember these processors grew, you know, were, were in a time when, you know, 7 megahertz, 7.15 megahertz, 4 megahertz, 12 megahertz was sort of like the high, high speed stuff. So, 
Um, I'm using a straight 68,000, right? Not any of the newer, like 68040s or 030s or so forth. Um, now, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the core, but essentially, um, as a result of the way the core is designed, um, the 66 megahertz translates to about 15 megahertz real world. Um, the other, and I think we've got some close-up shots, but this red board here is a custom SRAM circuit board that I designed with a lot of help from my friend in Canada, and um, this allows some SRAM memory, and we'll talk about the differences uh, in a couple minutes. Up here is a debug LCD, uh, right here, um, that displays things like what the current address that's being accessed, what the value is at that particular address, and then the, um, uh, and then the, the program counter, the value of the program counter for the next instruction. Um, you know, uh, working on this system gets me good at translating be back and forth between hex and decimal, so. Everything's in hex whether you like it or not, right? Um, here you've got a speaker, and this is a three watt speaker hooked up to a three watt amplifier. Um, and that's where my retro music is going to come out of. Um, I've got a proof of concept that's, that's uh, almost working, um, but, but that's, that's the way these projects go, right? Um, here's a switch that I bought in Radio Shack when I was about 10 years old, which I know I look like I'm really young, but um, it's, that's a really old switch that I happened to find. You know, I, I needed a big honking power switch. And then of course you see a battery, you know, a little RC car battery here that runs into this, uh, this power board right here. Okay, so, so what is this, right? I spent some time at the earlier part of the presentation talking about like what it isn't, so what is it? Standalone battery powered computer based on this, the Motorola 68000. And remember, this processor is from 1979, right? Old, old processor. And so, you know, as you uh, might have read in the description for the talk, I grew up on the Commodore Amigas. Any Amiga fans out here? Oh, yeah, right? And so, um, as a result, I had a lot of practice with 68,000 assembler. You, can you imagine what I was doing as like a 14-year-old with the 68,000 assembler? Any guesses? No? No, oh, well, no, so, so that's a good guess. I was never any good at that, but, um, but it was very much related to that. Um, so the interface currently runs, um, yeah, through, through a serial port, right, through a UART. And um, it doesn't run Linux. People have asked me, well, what OS does it run? Well, it doesn't run OS. Linux can't run on it. It won't work currently. Um, doesn't run applications from the App Store, right? Um, and so, you know, this, this contributes to the, um, to, the, to the slowness, right, of the, of the uh, development, right? Um, uh, custom hardware designed and integrated into an FPGA. Yeah, um, I think that for the majority of you guys here, I think just the fact that you've come to hope, right, you understand it. Like, this is a vehicle for learning, right? And some of my uh, sort of non-IT friends say, wait a minute, wh what are you doing again? Why are you doing that? Well, why, don't you, why don't you just buy a tablet, they tell me. Like, are you trying to save money? I'm like... I have three tablets, maybe five, right? I, I have ones that, uh, you know, that are last year's model that I consider too old to give to my kids, you know? And so this is not about like saving money. And I know I talk about low cost FPGAs and I do make a, I do distinguish them, right? Because I happen to be using a $30 board. And one of the reasons why I wanna use this board and why I am using this board is because there are plenty of FPGA boards that are out there that get up in cost, $100, $200, $250, and even more, depending. I wanted to be able to prove that I could do this on, with minimal resources, right? And so this is very similar to the way like the Atari game developers back in the day, like the Atari 2600, had to really account for every byte and say, well, how can I squeeze performance out of this? Um, there is a book called uh, Racing the Beam. It's an Atari book. Does anybody know this? A a MIT Press, right? Yeah. And so they really talk about how they're using the time in between 
the, uh, the video display to actually do computing, right? Um, I use a different method for what it's worth over here that, that works, but, um, but the point is, is that um, it's, it's easy to sort of win a street race if you're in a Ferrari or something like that. I wanted to be able to prove that I could still get it done, but without just dumping money at the problem. Um, so some skills are required, right? This is just like t-shirt required at those restaurants I talked about earlier. Um, PCB design skills. And, um, and I sort of know enough to be dangerous. My friend uh, Brian from Canada who rocks, really smart guy, did PCB design in the 80s. And I'm like, this is perfect. And so uh, I roped this guy in and he's really helped, um, but it was really a collaborative effort. And so I spent some time like, well, hey, what do you think about this? Um, and anybody who's done PCB design, um, like you spend a lot of times, uh, a lot of time routing, right? You spend a lot of time trying to figure out where those traces should go on the board, um, how wide you can make those traces. Can you still maintain signal integrity and so forth? Um, the, um, you need 68,000 assembly skills, um, and, and I have some, I know a little bit. Um, thank goodness for um, some of the resources that I'll point you guys to later online. Um, you need to know electronic circuit design, so how do you build, um, how do you build circuits, right? And so, and we'll talk about this more in some of these upcoming slides, right? But, um, you know, when you do FPGA design, it's very much not like coding, right? I saw a post recently that said, hey, I know how to program in C Sharp, so I should have no problem doing FPGA work. And I'm like, how is that related, right? They're two completely different things. And so, um, and we'll talk about uh, how they're different. Um, you know, Verilog HDL. And then also, in, and I touched on this earlier, right? Uh, computer architecture and organization. How does your design affect your performance? Um, I just recently got um, some, some basic 3D working on it, so I can rotate 3D wireframes, which is exciting, um, but it's really, really slow. So what, what am I doing wrong? How can I optimize that? What is it about my system? And, and, and the scary part is, what if it's something fundamental, right? What if I have to go back? So. Um, so I made a decision uh, to go integrated versus discrete. And so let's sort of explain that there's sort of a couple different methods. Now I'm going to show you two methods that are not the FPGA method, right? And so this is one way you can go. Um, you can buy all the parts just like they did back in homebrew computing in the 1970s. You can buy the RAM, you can buy the uh, CPU, you can put a crystal on there and so forth. But you can see what happens, right? A lot of the solutions that are online, instead of using the straight 68,000, which uses the full, um, exposes a full 23 bits of address um, out um, its interface and a 16-bit bus, this is a lot of wires to move around. And we'll talk about um, the 68,000 being a memory mapped processor. And as a result, that bus, right, that data bus has to, um, uh, has to move to a lot of your different pieces in order to work. And so it ends up looking like this. And for what it's worth, right, I like didn't credit this person on purpose. Um, not because I think he did a bad job, right, but just the idea of like this gets messy and it gets messy fast. Um, yeah, so you either end up with a large custom PCB or wiring that looks like that. So the, the problem with doing this, and I have a ton of respect for people that are able to build things like this and they actually function, ton of respect for them, but I did not want to do this. And so the alternative here is this Kiwi 68K computer approach, which is like a fantastic design. This guy's been working at this for a really long time. Um, there's the link. So the alternative is doing a custom circuit board. And when you see the circuit board, I don't know about you guys, but this looks as professional as it gets, right? Um, uh, this is, I, don't, I can't tell you how many years and years of work. Because remember that a lot of us that are involved in this are like one-man shows. Um, you're kind of lucky if you get sort of a smart friend that can 
can chip in and help out. And in some cases, I, I have. But um, in order for this, I can't imagine the amount of work that goes into it. And when you, when you look at this, right, this could be a real computer, right? This could have been sold back in the day. Um, the functions that this thing does is very, very much comparable with what's out there. So a ton of respect. So you can do this, but, re but notice something, right, that really what's happened is we've replaced all these individual wires here with just PCB traces on the circuit board, right? So it's still sort of um, discrete. And you know, there is a step beyond this. There are people that build computers using just straight logic, right? So they use 7,400, you know, 74 series logic chips to build their CPUs, to build these things. Now we're talking about wires. You wanna talk about wires, right? And so, um, and so, but notice that even though it's a circuit board, right, we still have the individual chips that are here with all the separate functions. And you, and you know, uh, for what it's worth for like reverse engineering and understanding how this works, this is actually better approach, right? Because I can take a logic analyzer and I can hook a logic analyzer up to one of these chips and I can watch communication that happens between the chips to understand it. And so that's nice, um, but obviously there's all the time, effort, and expense. A circuit board of this size is pretty expensive to produce. The ones I've made, and I've only made um, two in my life, they've been relatively small size, and, um, and they're, they're relatively cheap, but when you start going up to big sizes like this, it gets pretty expensive, especially because, you know, these board houses aren't really doing much um, in terms of checking your design. They check to make sure that what you told them to build, they built properly, but nothing about whether or not pin one of U6 is supposed to go to pin two of U8, right? Okay, so what are the specs of this machine that I've built? 68K soft core, um, which it's kind of funny every time I say that. It's just, I, I wish there was some other way to describe this. Um, slower than a real 68K, um, 66 megahertz, you can read. Um, yeah, so it does four MIPS, so four million instructions per second, which is really not too bad. Um, I can do a million multiplies. Now, part of the problem, say that again? Okay, and so, um, and so we've got a whole bunch of um, uh, specs here. Uh, multiple types of memory, um, flash memory, SRAM, uh, VGA support, a serial UART, um, an integrated DAC for the audio, and then a debug LCD as you, as you saw. And so here's a, here's a blow up of some of the physical hardware components. Um, the FPGA board on the right, and then my custom red circuit board on the left there. And so um, some people have asked me, well, why don't you use the onboard DRAM for the frame buffer? Well, part of the problem is the DRAM has the bandwidth, um, but as a result of the way DRAM is accessed, including things like having the necessary refresh circuitry to keep it working, um, the way you access it by row, by bank, by page, um, changes the latency of the individual reads, right? And so what that means is that this time you might be able to read in some short period of time, let's say 50 nanoseconds, but next time, because that's located on another page, because you may have to open and close a row, then what happens is your latency increases. But video is unrelenting in its thirst for data, right? And so whenever you are displaying um, data, video data, you can't really starve that, the, the video display, right? Then you get things like tearing and, and just ugly video. And so here's um, VGA timing diagram. And essentially, that big portion in, in blue on the right-hand side um, shows, the, um, shows the time in which you have to transmit your data, um, your actual video data. And so essentially, you've got 25 microseconds to transmit all of the pixel data for one particular row. 
Well, that's not a lot of time, right? Because remember, we're dividing that um, into, you know, 640 pixels wide, let's say. And so all of a sudden, you have to be able to provide this, this uh, data quickly. Um, so I talked about Verilog um, earlier. And so this is um, an example of the Verilog that I've created and that I've connected together. So we start with sort of this modified CPU. Um, we connect the UART for the console port um, using a Yamaha chip for the, for the music and so forth, right? And so there's a series of different modules that are all connected together. And so if we talk about FPGAs, right, um, we, um, you know, these FPGAs are where we can store these custom logic that we create. And so when we talk about sort of um, integrating everything, we talk about putting all of that hardware, instead of there being separate chips, which you see very few sort of chips outside of the FPGA on my board, um, essentially, um, it's all built into that, that FPGA. So um, uh, HDLs can be miles away from other languages, so they're not, um, they're not uh, procedural at all. And so normally, right, with CPUs, you've got this fetch to code execute cycle, right, where you pull a particular instruction out of memory, you decode that in instruction to figure out what you need to do, and then you execute the addition function or whatever the function is. But FPGAs are blank. They don't do anything, right? So you get an FPGA for the first time and you say, okay, let's see it do something. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there. It, it's, you, haven't told, you haven't described any of the functions that you need to, to do. And so here's a picture of Altera's Cordis. So I'm using an uh, uh, Altera-based FPGA. Um, and Quartus is the programming software, so this is the IDE. And so you can see on the um, right-hand side here some actual Verilog code. I'm sure you probably can't read it too well. Um, but you have a whole bunch of um, individual Verilog files that are located here, and then down here shows the results of the compilation or of the synthesis of your Verilog code to actually create hardware. And so here's what a, um, a Verilog module looks like. Um, pretty straightforward. You essentially have inputs and outputs. And this is just like the header, right? This is just like the, you know, what, what do they call it? A functional specification. It's basically the inputs and the outputs to the particular module. And so you'll see some inputs like a key, right? Um, which would be like a physical button that we're pressing. And then you see inputs and outputs like in the form of a UART talking to the serial ports. Thanks. And then um, finite state machines are the way we go about, um, about um, describing this hardware. It's one um, construct we use within these HDLs to essentially describe the, um, the different logic functions. And so if we take a look at um, this diagram here, which I drew on a notepad and photographed like yesterday or this morning, um, essentially you could see how the flow works, right? So you start in state one there, um, then some trigger happens, we go to state two and maybe we do some functions there, and then maybe the next clock tick we go to three, and then maybe we sit inside three until we push a button, then we go back to step one. And so you can see where we could actually do some, um, some um, processing, um, some procedural processing here, like you might be used to in other languages. Um, and so the 68K is a memory map device, right? And so what that means is, and I mentioned this earlier, that all those peripherals have to be connected to the address uh, bus, uh, address in the data bus in order to, to function. The, here's the memory map for my device here. And so this shows all the different address ranges. And then this shows the, the Verilog 
that tells basically what data to connect back. So essentially, if you see this RD data register, and for those not familiar with the hardware, if you can just think variable, this RD data variable gets assigned a result that comes back from these other modules based on what address we're talking to. So for instance, at the bottom, if we're communicating with the SRAM, then um, addresses that are in that range of, 820,000 hex to that to the other big number then it gets assigned uh, then it gets assigned the result from the SRAM module um, the software um, that I started with was written in 1988 um, that through some um, clever porting methods I was able to get to actually run and execute on my hardware so um, it's nice to go 30, sort of 30 years ago um, and bring this stuff back from the dead. So uh, what can it do? Main access is through the uh, serial port. We can print some text on the screen. We can do uh, simple graphics like lines and circles, um, debug uh, software via that LCD that I showed you, rotating 3D wireframes. I'm happy, happy about that. So I am running short on time. So um, I'm not used to quoting presidents here, but I figure, hey, this is my one opportunity. Um, yeah, uh, JFK said during his famous moon speech, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard. And I've got some other plans to expand this. I've got some resources listed here in terms of books and websites. Um, TechTravels.org is my website. It's a blog that's been in continuous operation for about 14 years and covers a variety of different uh, retro Amiga-inspired projects. Thanks for your interest. Um, so do we have time for questions or? No, yes. Nobody's here that cares. Got some time. Okay. All right. Thank you.